great. Well, hi, everyone. It's good Hello. to see you all. And you. thanks for joining in on this uh, lovely Thursday evening. I'm Sarah. And for those who don't know, I'm one of the ministers at uh, Colonial Church. And sorry if you heard that. I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> the YouTube was playing live in my ear. <laughs> Um, so now I was very confused about who sounded a lot like me. Um, so I'm just here to welcome and kind of do a little introduction. And uh, the real hosts and stars of the show tonight are on my screen anyway, to my right and left. I don't know about yours because the Brady Bunch mixes itself up every time you jump on Zoom. Uh, so I'll just say a little bit about what we're doing here tonight. This is part of the Faith and Humanities series that we're doing this year at the church of really wanting to explore the intersections uh, between faith and the humanities. And it's third Thursdays every um, month uh, of this, this calendar year that we'll be doing that. And so at the end, I think you'll get to hear about an exciting opportunity that's coming up uh, that, that they'll share more with you. But tonight we're here to talk a little bit about why does music move us and joining us to help to facilitate and foster the space for the conversation, uh, our very own Jenny and also Elise. And Jenny is a licensed clinical social worker and has certifications in spiritual direction as well as health and wellness coaching with focus on pain management. Many of you know her, she's been in the community at the church for many years and is involved. Uh, she's now the chair of the adult education ministry action team. And as many of you know, is a member of the Corral and has been a just lover of music throughout her life and was part of the Minnesota Symphonic Winds for 24, over 20 years mm -hmm. as a flautist. Um, and then just also about Jenny and some of you know this from her, her story, uh, music has just been really significant through times of joy and struggle and everything in between. So thank you for leading and holding this space tonight, Jenny. And we also have with us our very own Corral director, Dr. Elise Hecker is currently the director of a few different things, Riverside Singers at Augsburg, also here at Colonial Church and then is on the music faculty at Shattuck St. Mary's and uh, is also an artistic coordinator for the Northfield Youth Choir and their concert choir and is an artistic director for Sea Change Trouble Choir in St. Paul. Uh, I also know that she is partnered and has a kid and you know then in her spare time um, also just loves music and does more with music in every part of her life. Uh, she's done a lot of different things, has brought a real rich depth to our community and the music that she's invited us to participate in. And you can, if you want to learn more, and in case you haven't, I will just say this, I know her parents are here. I have read her dissertation. If you want to read a really thoughtful dissertation about, um, <laughs> about you should, you should definitely read it. Um, we're maybe hoping in the spring to host some more conversations. So, so grateful that you both are here and um, I'll turn over to you in just a second. Uh, Jenny's gonna help us just with some grounding invitations, but before we do that, let's just pause for a second and uh, just open the space with prayer. So will you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you for the gift of life and the gift of music. Thank you for the ways in which you sing over and in and through us. Might we this night listen for the movement and tenor and pitch of your spirit, that we might join you more fully in the dance and hear the reverberations of your spirit's work that has been at work singing songs throughout all of history, that we might indeed continue to find our place in that good choir and to sing songs that heal and change. It's in Christ's name that we gather and pray. Amen. 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 All right, Jenny. Over to you. Hi, everybody. Whoa. I cannot. I'm getting emotional. It is so. I feel so blessed to see your beautiful faces. <laughs> it is just. It's a blessing. Um, I'm going to invite you all to pull out a piece of paper and something to write with for our time together. Tonight, we're going to both build understanding of why it's meaningful, as well as explore ways to engage with music. 
Our goal is for you to take tonight's experience into your daily lives as you interact with music moving forward. Before we get started with what we intend to be a really interactive time together, I wanna establish some ground rules and just uh, send the, put this out into our space as an offering. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, be aware we are live on YouTube. And so we have a couple of options for sharing. You are more than welcome to verbally share as we are talking. Just know that it will be public on YouTube. So the other option is for you to use the chat feature uh, when we have our sharing time. And you can type that in and we will just share um, your thoughts uh, anonymously so that they're still part of the conversation, but then that also honors your privacy. We, and because the reason that we want to establish that is we want this to be a safe place of exploration and we're going to explore a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different perspectives are going to emerge. You may hear something different from your own perspective about music or how you interpret the music that we're going to explore today. So we just invite you to stay open and willing to hear from each other. And please be respectful of the time. Uh, we have really tried to plan this uh, within the limited time we have because music is such a huge subject, especially for us here in our community. We wanna hear from as many of you as possible and just you know, make sure to, to try to not be, not try to dominate the discussion. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Elise to get us started. Fantastic. Thanks, Jenny. I was yeah. really, really delighted that she asked me to partner with her for this conversation um, because I don't have to tell many of you, if you get me on the subject of music, especially how important music should be to the entire world, we would be here for probably three and a half weeks. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm delighted to, to get to talk about this. And I, I am going to share my screen with you um, just because I have a, um, a um, power, whoops, whoops, a doodle. Um, let me, I had it backed up here. Um, to uh and technical challenges are so fun i know we'll get there don't look don't look don't look <laughs> okay <clears throat> oh goodness there we are now we're cooking with gas okay <clears throat> so <clears throat> When, when Jenny and I were talking about this topic, I, uh, and, and narrowing it down, um, it was difficult to do, of course, and, and talking about music as it functions in our worshipful life, as it, um, as it, um, in our personal relationships, um, and so forth, it's, it's difficult to to narrow it down to to something and so we're, we're taking a really really large amount of content material and and giving you a, a sort of a, a surface overview we're going to dip down into some details um, maybe some things you hadn't considered before about how and why music is as powerful as it is um because i'm going to start from the assumption that you maybe all believe that too um and let's go. Oh, heavens. Well, I'm freezing up here a little bit. So I might stop it and restart it again, if you don't mind. All right. Elise is dealing with a bit of an ancient computer, so. I am. Well, if it doesn't work, then right, I'll just. Elise, keep... if you if you need to, you could send me the tech the link potentially. I don't know if I could. I can share it with you, quick as a okay. button. 
And then you can continue and I'll pull it up. Yeah, thank you. Coming to you now. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I, I, the first thing I wanted to talk about was what music provides. And I split it up into what music provides a community and what music provides an individual. And I'm, I'm gonna start with the community. And as I did some research and thought back to, to the sort of extrinsic benefits of music, um, I came, I narrowed it down to, to four E's, letter E's. And, and this is because the making of art for most of our existence as a species has been in an effort to express hope and to quell fear. Um, this is as primal as finding food or assuring prosperity and safety or ritual for curing illness or keeping us safe. Ah, thank you, Sarah. And so, I hate to give you directions, but if you can move us forward, Sarah, that would be great. Here are some fun quotes, but moving on. Here we are. That's fine. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so the first E of what music provides a community, if you want to hit the return, Sarah, is that it has an economy of message. In other words, music doesn't need to take a lot of time or a lot of language to get its point across much the same way that poetry does right there is you can say a lot and express core beliefs with a minimum of text when you're using music the next e if you want to hit return sarah is that music is easily remembered. I could probably start singing songs from our Sunday school classes and every single one of you would just jump right in with me, right? I could even start doing some actions of deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain. All of those things, they just rush back in a memory. That's why we use music in nursery rhymes or for teaching skills and content to young children is that you remember it so easily. The next E, Sarah, <laughs> is, you're very good at this, um, is music is primary for establishing and expanding a group identity. And this can be in that we find connection with others because of our similar tastes and preferences or simply because we have enjoyed the same musical experience on purpose or by accident. There's also a, a sense of safety <laughs> in a group, right? Small thing. Um, so when we participate in a ritual with other people, we then not only feel as if we have I made an I group identity together, but we even develop a sense of obligation to one another. And this is crucial for reinforcing a group's like-mindedness and might we say our one-heartedness, <laughs> that artistic rituals and ceremonies, they help persuade people to devote themselves to ideals that transcend the self. Um, and this, in turn, brings a sense of loyalty, generosity. It even has been proven that people will work harder when they have it shared musical experience within a group. That I, we, we have seen this used for both benefit and evil in terms of nationalism and patriotism. Um, for for moving political agendas ahead and and even throughout history the sacrifice of one's life for group identity and then finally we have uh well i should say thank you sarah i i should also say under that third bullet point 
music is also one of the safest and and simplest ways to introduce a large group of people to another culture. You get to experience hearing the music from somewhere else, hearing the belief system from somewhere else with very little asked of you, especially if you're a, if you're a, a consumer of that uh, as opposed to a participant. So um, the exposure, ooh, there's another E. We're getting up to like five or six E's here. Um, but there's the exposure to cultures that are, are not familiar to you. And then finally, we, we benefit from, from music it's, it, by its ability to encourage an empathetic response to us, okay? Uh, or from us, I should say. Making music with other people specifically requires trust, cooperation, contact sometimes, and coordination. All of those things start to develop into something that, that has been termed the theory of mind, which is that you begin to anticipate what those around you are thinking and feeling. That anticipation morphs itself into empathy. You begin to know what it must be like to have experienced something, even though yourself, it has not happened to you. Okay? So, Sarah, we might jump ahead. Yeah, to what music now provides the individual? This is the intrinsic. And the first thing is that it gives us a very, very strong association. We have heightened associations with music. In fact, statistically, sound and smell are the strongest triggers of memory. I know that I can hear a certain song and be instantly transported back to a specific time and place, and I can even think of the people that were there, right? Same thing with if I smell something cooking, right? Or if I smell something that reminds me of one of my grandmas. I picture there with me, right? This is a, a way, whether accidentally or, or intentionally, we make connections of our events with the people that participated with us. And you can even use this, these associations, to expand uh, or even change your musical preferences. For example, if you have a really great experience and there happens to be music playing that maybe you wouldn't normally listen to, you might actually begin to enjoy that music more because of the association you've made from having a pleasant experience. Uh, the next thing is the building of relationships. This is on a smaller scale than, than what we were talking about with the community in terms of, of expanding group identity. These relationships um, are, are for the individual. In other words, participating in music, either as a, like making the music or as the consumer, someone listening to it, actually puts you in a sense of belonging. You have a community, either they're making the music with you or they're sharing in that um, experience with you. And this is true not just for the specialists and the professionals, but also the amateurs. You know, so many people say that that they they love music, but actually what might have either gotten them into it or even keeps them into music is the social aspect, is the relationships that they make participating or consuming that music. And it's the idea of, of participating in something that is bigger than yourself, right? The process, but also the product, that it is, it is larger than something you can do on your own. The third bullet point here is <laughs> this idea of escapism. And I can't tell you how many times over the last six, seven months trapped in my home that I have used music as a means of escape. But this idea that you can transcend what is happening right then and there. It's, 
it falls in line with the idea that you can get goosebumps or chills when you hear something that really, really speaks to you. And this, um, this also something that falls underneath this is the fact that when we make music, we are engaging the entire body. It is what is called a whole body activity. We are using the musculature for our posture and our breathing and our support, right? We're doing audiation of pitch and pronunciation. Um, we are feeling, we are even relating the tempo of a piece and its rhythm to our own heartbeat and our own body rhythms. That our entire person participates in music making. And that allows the individual to step outside of whatever situation is happening at that time, right? And, and even if you're not physically moving to somewhere else, your body is participating in something that takes so much concentration, you might as well have, <laughs> have escaped to somewhere else. And then the final bullet point here is that music can often provide enhanced self-awareness. And what I mean by that is the act of creating or of doing something is really useful to address uncertainty. That when we feel that there is something unknown, the act of doing of something, creating something actually relaxes us. And I'm gonna get into more of the chemicals on that in just a little while, so hold tight. But it is made even more strong. I'm gonna tie this back actually to the community. When we participate in this ritual of creating art, when we do that with other people, when we collaborate with our fellows, we have, even if it's momentary, we have a sense of control, even if that uncertainty still lingers. Just the fact that we are doing something and making something occur, um, it, it statistically and, and, and medically, chemically has shown a reduction in stress. And, and to push that even further, art overall, but music in particular, has continually explored and offered coping mechanism really for, for life's transitoriness, for lack of a better word, right? Or the anxiety that comes with mortality, that that, that level of unknown can be explored artistically and we can safely use poetry and melody and rhythm to put forth our ideas of what might be next. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Jenny. So Sarah, I don't know if you can um, stop sharing there for a moment. Thanks. <laughs> and we will um, let Jenny take over from here. Wonderful. We are going to, uh, one of the reasons we asked Sarah to go ahead and stop sharing is we're going to move into our first conversation of the evening. To start the conversation, I wanted to share a little bit myself. We're going to talk about how music, uh, the current of music shows up in our lives, especially with all that we're dealing with right now with COVID and in our culture and everything that's going on. And one of the things that came up for me is a way that I have implemented music in my evening gratitude practice. Uh, this is something that's really important to me. And when I'm in that place of angst or anger or grief, what I notice coming up just within my soul is that song, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so pure and free. And my soul just sings that at night. And it calms me enough to be able to go to sleep. 
uh, but to go to sleep in a place of gratitude uh, versus anxiety or fear. We'd like to open it up and ask, what experiences have you had when music has moved you? And please take yourselves off mute and join in the discussion. I can see people contemplating. There are so many experiences where music has moved me. I don't even know where to begin, but I want to touch on a bit of what's been happening in this coronavirus era. I was missing singing so, so very much. And luckily when um, Colonial changes the hymnals, they have given them away. So I had an old Colonial hymnal. And so every day I would sing hymns just to sort of calm my spirit, and it is what gets me through the day, every day. Mm -hmm. Here's a reason we sit next to each other in choir, huh, Ginny? <laughs> yep. uh, thank you. And you're giving Elise a wonderful dovetail for the next section of what she's gonna talk about too, so. Someone said in the chat that they're just with what we've talked about so far and shared that they're experiencing tears. What else? I feel like I've been talking already, but it's what I do. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think like like Jenny, you know, to choose one instance almost feels like cheating all the other ones. <laughs> um, but what I can say for for what music has brought into my life is the ability to the people that I have met through music that I might not have met otherwise from around the world. The ability to travel and make music and hear music that I never would have heard in any other circumstance and to meet those people and to know that no matter what our differences are, whether our lives have, have been different from the beginning in every possible way, the fact that we love music, we love to make music together means that we have something in common, that it is absolutely universal even if I've known them for 20 years or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a wonderful sharing in the chat. I think I will appreciate so much more the musical experiences I can return to post COVID. I think the emotions will be more intense at orchestra and choral concerts and singing in worship after being away so long. I would just like to say that um, as Elise's mother, I can I know from um, almost birth, at least toddler age on, um, music has been a calming or really critical part of her life. But um, in those times when um, it was hard to go to sleep as an infant, um, just doing some chanting and making up songs has been uh, very effective. And I think it's just brought us as a family much closer together. Yeah, she mm. even lets me sing in her choir. <laughs> we uh, had another, we have a couple of other things um, in the chat. I am experiencing vision issues. So the lyrics such as Be Thou My Vision is so comforting. Someone else said, we had the opportunity to visit the Scott Joplin house in St. Louis a few weeks ago, and it was incredibly powerful. After being without live music for such a long time, we got to hear a young black composition student play the pineapple rag just for us. It brought me to tears. 
And someone else said, for me, there are four moments. Singing Heilig in cathedrals in Europe. Gregory Porter with the Minnesota Orchestra was transcendent. Listening to pop music in my car with the windows down, singing at the top of my lungs. So, so many other mo moments. Music is so important to me from crying on my own in my dorm room to singing with others to Silent Night at Christmas. Thank you all so much. We are going to uh, move into uh, experiencing a, our first piece of music together. What I'm gonna invite you to do uh, as some of you already experiencing tears, you might want to go get some Kleenex. Uh, but as it plays, we're going to invite you to acknowledge what's happening within you in preparation for Elisa's next section. What emotions are you experiencing? What thoughts come up? And what do you notice happening in your body? So Sarah, if you could play that link and share it with the group, that would be great. Great, pulling it up. Oh 
All right, Elise, I'm turning it back over to you. And Sarah, I think she wants to return to her PowerPoint. Thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. So that's it. <laughs> Um, and maybe we can just take a minute to, you can unmute yourself if you want to, but um, just to even use some words to describe emotions you felt, or even if you noticed what was going on in your body while you heard that. If anybody, or you can type it into the chat. We had a couple of responses in the chat already, very comforting and reminding somebody of going to church with their grandmother growing up. I noticed how stark the landscape was in the background and it made me yearn for both human contact and for God. It was just very lonely. I noticed when the music all of a sudden got very quiet and it was the voice and the, the very high violin, there's there's like a moment of just breath where you're holding your breath and it, it's there's so much that you experience with breathing and not breathing as you, as you, as I at least as I respond to the music. Hmm? Someone said in the chat they felt gradual feelings of peace. Mm -hmm. I will say, um, similar to what Jim, Ginny shared earlier, um, music has been my way has, of connecting. And this is a hymn that has just come to me. And for some reason, it just keeps repeating to me. Someone said in the chat, they felt their whole body relax. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a beautiful segue into why are you feeling these things? <laughs> what is actually happening? And, and that, that's fine, Sarah, thank you. Um, and there are three chemicals that your body releases as you participate or listen to music that you enjoy. And the first is oxytocin, tocin, oxytocin, sorry. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the chemical that we associate with actually making social connections. It's sometimes referred to as the social bonding chemical or the love chemical. Um, and, and it hits in the, one of the most primal places in your brain, in that pituitary gland. And it, like the oldest part of the of the human brain and makes us feel a responsibility and connection to each other the next chemical that you feel when you listen to music that you enjoy is dopamine and this is the pleasure chemical right that we often associate with reward and motivation and actually has a really strong tie to memory that we we often remember things for which we are for, for which we are rewarded so when we get a flood of dopamine into our bodies we are creating a memory and that is why when you listen to music you you enjoy or you're making music you enjoy um you you often then F create a really, really powerful memory. And then finally, the last one is serotonin. And this is associated with regulating your body. So those of you who said that you just felt your body relax as the music went along, yes, you probably got flooded with serotonin. Hmm. And this also increases your immune system. It aids in digestion, it helps you sleep. So Jenny, when you sing to yourself before sleep, 
brilliant. <laughs> You're releasing your serotonin so that that you you actually sleep better. This is all three of these chemicals are also found um, in in great amount in new mothers. Mm. And they help to make connection, the, the mother child bond. Um, and probably why then we associate singing and music making um, with that relationship, that mother child relationship. So we actually start to develop this anticipatory chemical release when we are about to sing music that we really like or we our favorite song comes on the radio and you feel that jolt that is your body remembering these chemicals and creating this new excitement in you and you start to then crave it and that's why we have favorite songs that we listen to over and over and over it's because we're trying to recreate these emotions. And in fact, it has been proven that utilizing music as a me with with the chemical reaction that happens in our bodies is a, a very effective way of healing memory loss, which is why music therapy is so useful um, for those that suffer from Alzheimer's and or dementia. Um, so I just find that to be so exciting that there is a biological reason <laughs> for why you enjoy the music you do um, and why you want to hear it over and over again. Elise, could I share a comment in the chat, the chat that summarizes this beautifully? Yes, please. To me, the music plus photography expanded my perspective. Hopeful, peaceful, a calming, familiar tune. Yes. And the familiarity is something that we'll talk about soon as well. Mm -hmm. That when we have these chemical releases, when we've created these associations with music that so much so that it becomes familiar, that is also a beautiful way to calm and relax yourself, which is why we go back to, the, to, the, to music that we like mm -hmm. <laughs> over and over. Sarah, if we can move on to the next one. Next can I, slide. Can I say something? Please. Um, I saw that TV show last night, uh, Zach, about clowns on TV. Yes. Oh, that made me cry last night. It just gave me goosebumps. Oh, thank you, Andrea. I'm going to have to look into that. I have no idea what that is. She just gave us an opportunity to have a new experience. Yay. I saw that too. It was really wonderful. Cool. Yes, it was. All right. Now we know what to go watch for. <laughs> All right. Um, so now that we've sort of set some found framework and shared personal stories and and talked about why music provides what it does it it makes perfect sense to then shift into why then we use music in worship and i imagine many of you are already answering the questions from from what we <laughs> what we've talked about earlier this evening you can sort of jump to the the conclusions here but uh, beyond the fact that it creates for us this beautiful identity and one heartedness, which I love and I'm going to use forever. Um, but the role of music is biblical. And the, uh, we're talking Old Testament as the Egyptians crossing over the Red Sea, the people of Israel sang a song to the Lord. This is Exodus, right? They sang to the Lord. It was part of the, the Israelites formal worship, both in the tabernacle and and temple the psalms themselves right just a a a very rich testimony to joy and sorrow and praise and and lament that we raise our voices in in song and to god 
um, that him singing is even practiced by Jesus and his disciples, as we, we can find that in, in Matthew 26. And that the Apostle Paul in, instructed the um, instructed that, and I'm taking this from Colossians, here we are, three. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all, wind, in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give thanks to God the Father through him. The Bible tells us to sing. And that is what we will do. <laughs> with our hearts and our minds and our bodies. The other reason that we use music in worship, and it's there for us, is that it allows us to create, to serve. We might not be rich with financial resources. Um, we might not be able to cook for the potlucks, right? But you might have a God-given gift to make music. And sharing and fostering that talent, I think, and other, I hope others agree, it remains one of the most consistent and vital things that a congregation can do to demonstrate gratitude for God and their community. Mm -hmm. To say, this is what I do possess and willingly share. And not just share, but grow, make better all the time, enhance, foster. And then finally, this ties back uh, to, to our earlier conversation as well, is that when we worship and we use music together, we create a communal memory, right? We, we, the biological chemicals flow, we see the people next to us, and, and making music with us, cre experiencing the same event with us. And we develop what, what Benedict Anderson, who, who I've spent quite a bit of time reading um, in the early 80s, he referred to these as our imagined communities. And I just, I really love that phrase that, that are, and because imagined communities are constantly changing and growing, right? More people are becoming involved, new and different people, because we are having new and different shared experiences all together when we worship. And it's not just Sunday morning, right? It's, it's in the rehearsals or when we share music with each other through email or whatever, there's so many different ways that we can share those music, musically worshipful experiences and create and expand our imagined community. So with that, we're just, I'm gonna take it right back to Jenny and we're gonna make some music together. We are, yay. Um, well, I just want to dovetail a little bit off of what Elise was saying, uh, speaking of worship. Uh, in preparation for this, uh, I was paying attention Sunday to what was happening to me in worship. And by the way, I don't know why I continue to be amazed by this, but I was so amazed at how Andrew and Rick totally set us up for, for tonight. Andrew doing the thing with the kids about ex how he experiencing music and then Rick closing with a mindfulness exercise. I, I, I don't know why I'm, I continue to be amazed the way God works, but wow. Um, but I was listening to Sunday's alternative service um, to kind of expand how I experience music. And they began singing this song, this pop song called Drift Away by Dobie Gray. And Immediately what happened to me is I noticed my body tense up and emotionally I was like, no. And I'm like, what in the world? Then I thought, Jenny, apply 
what you know and apply what you're talking about Thursday. And I just began to listen to the lyrics. And what stuck out to me is when my mind is free, you know a melody can free me. Thanks for the joy that you've given me. I want you to know that I believe in your song. And what this reminded me of is music is a reminder of God's presence in our lives. Sometimes God calls us into discomfort and we may initially perceive that as negative. And sometimes it's a calling to strip away the style of music in order to hear the underlying message. Sitting in that discomfort and applying what we practiced with Abide With Me and then identifying and acknowledging these things just allows us insight into what God is calling us to address in our lives. And this also applies when we, I know many of you have shared that you can't get a piece of music we've done in Sunday worship out of your head that the choir has sung or the musicians have performed. And we ask ourselves why? And Considering what opportunity emerges from sinking into the experience, whether it's positive or it's uncomfortable, and that calls us to identify what will progressively bring freedom and healing. So we are going to uh, visit and sit with a commonly know him, Amazing Grace. We're going to start out with verse one. And... Um, we are going, I'm going to invite you all to, to put yourselves on mute and uh, sing verse one with us. Okay. <clears throat> What this is, is an introduction into something Elise loves to call poetic mindfulness. We often listen to music we, we know very, very well on what I call autopilot because we feel so familiar with it. And what we're going to do is I'm going to invite you into a practice to experience Amazing Grace in a refreshing way. This is based on a practice that is known as Lectio Divina. So uh, as we move into this, uh, and as you consider this, we're going to um, just invite you to continue to pay attention to what emotions and what thoughts and what you notice happening in your body. Uh, as we dig into this more, just consider that. And uh, Elise is going to take us into some pieces about musical features of the hymn and of music. And then we're going to go back and revisit this again. But the reason we have you consider thoughts and emotions and really listening to those lyrics like you've never heard them before is you begin to realize why you, why you developed appreciation for that piece of music to begin with. It's like a rebirthing. Thanks. And, and Sarah, could we put the music up, please? Thank you. So I'm, I'm, well, and Jenny, before I dig into this, I didn't know if you wanted to um, ask folks to to uh, choose a verse to concentrate on. 
or would you rather? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You can um, absolutely choose a verse that you want to focus on and just, you know, read that over and really connect with it again, with the emotions, the thoughts, what you notice happening in your body. And as you're reading that through more, just really pay attention to that. Um, Elise, are you going to play the full piece now? I think I might talk about the mental features first. Okay, and then uh, as as you're as she's talking about this, pay attention to those things, and then I'm going to invite you into a into another practice uh, as we visit the whole hymn. Right. So. I love Amazing Grace. I think everybody does. It's just a, a melody that is so, so memorable and comforting. And there, there are actual reasons why um, this, the melody of this beloved hymn is actually based on a pentatonic scale. Penta meaning five tonic tone. So a five tone scale which is, is a, a modality of, of music writing that has spans the globe. In fact, we often hear it and we associate it uh, with more Asian cultures, truthfully, but it can be found in the music of, of the aboriginals, of, of um, Australia, of Native Americans throughout North and South America. And, and even it's used all the time in rock music, believe it or not, very, very popular. But it's this idea that we use if, if you want to channel your, your Julie Andrews of Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. Um, we're only using five tones of Do, Re, Mi, Sol, La, Sol, Mi, Re, Do. The pentatonic scale, those five notes. And if you look at the melody of Amazing Grace, without boring you too much on solfege, it only uses those five pitches, right? In a different key. So do, mi, do, mi, re, do, la, so. So do, mi, do, mi, We never sing fa and we never sing T. There are there is never a half step, the mi to fa or the T to do. This style and modality of writing music uh, was written about by Pythagoras, what, 1500 years, like 2500 years ago. But but actually, archaeologists have found bird bone flutes that are over 50,000 years old that use this same scale. So human development has been singing these five pitches in an organized fashion for over 50,000 years. That's why this melody feels so familiar and so comforting and, and recognizable that to take those five notes and organize them into such a beautiful recognized melody is is in our dna actually and the idea uh, of five the number five is even um exceptionally powerful and that it, it's a the number that da vinci associated with humankind and the five points of head and the four limbs um, and that the Greeks used uh, and referred to the five notes of the pentatonic scale as the music of the spheres, because at the time they only knew of five planets. So the fact that this melody feels like coming home to you is, is not chance. It is divine development for tens of thousands of years and aren't we so lucky that we are here to hear it <laughs> and to hear it in this organization and when we look at the rhythm the mode and you can even see it on the page 
the theory is this um, poetic meter called a uh, trochi, if you are, are into those sort of things, um, has a few other pronunciations, but this rhythmic mode of long, short, long, short, long, that we see here, which is also thousands of years old, sort of the reverse of iambic, if you're a Shakespearean fan. <laughs> um, this is the same sort of rhythm that we use in many, many, many of the nursery runs that we've learned. Mary had a little lamb, the stress release, stress release, or Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater. <laughs> That, that these just bring us back to our childhood. Dr. Seuss used these to great effect <laughs> and why we can remember his one, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, right? Um, that not, not only is the melody of Amazing Grace ancient and primal and recognizable, at, but the rhythm is as well. This sort of stress and release, stress and release. And then to find and create beautiful, meaningful poetry that is going back to one of our very first ideas, an economy of message gets right to the point. And then to weave them all together is what makes this one of the most recognized and memorable hymns in a modern history. So I will turn now back to Jenny before we listen to it. All right. So now what we're going to do is um, we are going to play the full piece of Amazing Grace and invite you to hum or sing along, whatever you'd like. Um, you'll, you know, we'll continue to have you on mute. The invitation here is how is God calling you in this moment through a word or phrase that stands out to you? And we want you to consider those intrinsic and extrinsic aspects. Specifically, how I'm going to invite you to do that is imagine or actually bring your hands to cross in front of you. And then extend your open arms out into the world. And as you do, listen for the following. Embrace what God is calling you to embrace internally for your own journey with God and your own relationship with God. And then open your arms to what God is calling you to extend out into the world. And as we play this, I even encourage you, if you'd like, to kind of sway with the peace and do this as you're noticing specifically how God is calling to you through Amazing Grace tonight. And then we'll open into a time of sharing. Go ahead, Sarah. And if I can make things complicated, Sarah, could you show the music while this is playing? Uh, yes. <laughs> Give me one second. <laughs> Thank you. We know Sarah's so good at the technical stuff. We decided to challenge her. You know, that's just accidental. <laughs> that I, know. <laughs> I get people telling me the same thing, Sarah. Figure it out, Jenny. You're so good at technical stuff. A fun fact about this recording is that it was recorded at the church in which I was married. And so I have wonderful memories as I watch this video, but it was also one of the few congregations singing Amazing Grace where they sang all the verses. Mm. <laughs> so your, your mind and body is already swelling with chemicals, huh, Elise? It is. My memory. <laughs> Connection, exactly. There you go, yay. <laughs> so 
sorry. Um, it's okay. okay. All right, all right. Okay, I, I figured. I figured out what my problem was. All right, here you go. Give me one second here. Now I'll pull them back. Can you see both of them now? Yes. Thank I you. Do Okay, you. here we go. If we could possibly Ooh. stick larger, we would love it, but I'll work on that. Well, we wanted to open it up briefly just for um, you to give it a chance to let you share how God has spoken to you specifically through this piece, um, again, in the chat or verbally. Uh, we also really invite you to write it down and sit with it this week and explore that. But anything that anybody would like to share?
This is Sarah, and I think um, I, I mean I've I've long loved this song, and you know that I really appreciate at least how you helped us understand that there's something actually in our bones, <laughs> like generationally about just the actual music of it because it feels that way, you know. Um, but I think the thing that I love about it is that knowing the context in which the lyrics for this hymn were, was written. And it's in the story of a man who was part of the slave trade. And that that's what grace looks like, mm -hmm. is what happens when we're awakened in that sort of way, that the opening up of the gospel opens us up to care for all of God's children and God's world and brings us to repentance um, in the ways that we have harmed and destroy the image of God and others. And so I think when I learned that when I was in high school, mm. I had like, I knew the hymn before, but when I learned that, um, it became my favorite hymn. I did not know that. Thank you, Sarah. Wow. Well, I was transported back because we were members of that church for a couple of years. Mm. A choir that just sang. And, and when Elise talked about at the beginning community and how important community is, and I was just flooded no matter what congregation we've been a part of, how important community is and how that hymn is sung in so many different communities, yet I still have a special feeling for each community mm. when I hear that. So anyway, that was just kind of a interesting moment for me tonight to see that that organ again and, and hear that choir. So thank you. Oh, that's beautiful. Someone else said in the chat, I love um, to, where was it? Oh, verse two addresses respecting, fearing God and God relieves our fears timely for today. And then someone else said, I love the phrase, and grace will lead me home. No matter where I am in my faith or my life, that is reassurance. Well, um, I know we've had about 15 minutes yet, and we have yet another piece to present. So I want to warn you, we might go a little bit over, um, but uh, Elise, do you want to introduce this one? Yeah. Um, and Sarah, if you wouldn't mind pulling up just the last slide, I would be grateful. Thank you. Um, this is the piece, even when he is silent. Uh, this text has been set before, and I think uh, before I began my time with Colonial, uh, this was sung by the chorale in a, in, uh, um, set by a different composer uh, and, and with a different title, I believe. Um, but this is by Norwegian composer Kim Andre Arneson. And um, the text, especially the, the first six lines is what is utilized in this piece and others. But I wanted to share with you the fact that this poem that, as you can see, was written on the wall of a cellar um, in the Cologne concentration camp by a Jewish prisoner during World War II. Um, it's much longer, actually, than, than what we, we sing in, um, and what even uh, Arneson sets in his piece. But I just want to give you a few moments to read through this poem on your own. And if I can um, also just for me mention that this has so many beautiful ties with Amazing Grace um, in its text.
to be in a situation like this author yet to have the faith to be able to write these words is something for which I am both grateful um, that I, I haven't had to experience and absolutely humbled by the fact that someone else had this level of strength, belief, and commitment, and, and hope um, that, that they could think these things in the midst of what is a, a gross human tragedy. Um, and so when we think about the, even the um, circumstances surrounding Amazing Grace, and, and the harm that we as humans can inflict upon each other, um, that, and then we look at the, the situation um, surrounding the writing of this text, um, I can see and feel a lot of similarities. And I, I also start to feel a little frustrated and even angry at at why, why we do the things we do to each other. But what I love about Kim Andre Arneson's setting of this piece is, and you'll hear it as we listen to it, is unrelenting dissonances. Parts of the music where you will hear notes next to each other that never actually resolve. They just sit there in dissonance. And I think that is his attempt to capture this, this idea that there is struggle, suffering, and, and that it is our hope and faith that is the resolution to these. So every once in a while, the composer then releases us from those dissonances. So if we've, we've been hearing things like this, and then he'll release us to some big, beautiful major chord. And so I, I encourage you as you listen to this, and, and he only sets the first six lines of the poem to, to find those times where there is intentional angst written into the music, and then times when the composer releases that stress for us. He re offers us resolution. For me, that is what pulls my emotions and makes me yearn and hear this music and this text in such a, a different and unique way. Jenny? We are going to uh, play a recording of this for you. And so we're going to invite you to do an abbreviated version, kind of combined version of what we've been doing tonight. Paying attention to what word or phrase uh, sticks out to you and that God is calling to you through. And how is God speaking to you in your own life through that? And take some time to write that down. And you can play the recording, Sarah.
All right. Well, we wanted to um, close our time tonight. I, I have a, we both have a little bit of, of wrapping up to do, but we wanted to just open up for you all to share uh, what you're taking away from our time together tonight and what you're gonna choose to embrace and extend. Jenny, you're on mute still. <laughs> oh, try, try again. Right, you did um, it earlier. Got it, there got you it. go. You got it. I am very refreshed by all of this, by, by the musical understanding by the poetry understanding, by sharing this experience with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Sarah and to Elise and to Jenny. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for being here, Jenny. Somebody said, I feel like I was listening to a host of angels. Uh, I'll just rather than writing it, I'll just say that it just gives me a deeper appreciation about how music has been woven into my life experiences as long as I can remember, both uh, really uh, uh, positive, blessed highs and some of the really painful times too. I just have a deeper appreciation and we'll even be more aware of that. Thank you, Betty. We are getting lots in the chat here. Making music with the chorale is so precious. Looking forward to returning to singing again. I am reminded to really listen and feel rather than mindlessly have the music on. It is a good reminder to listen to music at home more often since it's so good for my health. This was beautiful, thanks. Elise, do you have it? I, I'll close with kind of my challenge and takeaway and then you can make your announcement. Well, we have, as you all have said beautifully, we've learned and practiced a lot tonight. Um, my kind of invitation challenge to you all is exactly what some of you have said. Connect more deeply with familiar hymns, anthems, especially as we head into Ad Advent and Christmas. We, we encounter and we hear again, very familiar pieces of music and I really encourage you to practice what we've talked, we've done tonight and interact with this season in some new and as Ginny said, fresh ways. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, all of you for being with us tonight. It has truly been a blessing to me. Uh, Elise has a fun announcement for us. Yeah, and before I do that, I, I do just wanna extend my gratitude to everyone for being here and those that are going to watch later. And um, yes, really to Jenny for, for having this beautiful idea and seeing it through. Um, so a, a beautiful way to connect us, even if we can't um, be making music in the way that we would love to as well. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to let you know that my my other half, um, Art Hecker, will be doing um, a, a, a seminar for the Faith and Humanities in February on the 18th, um, and he will be focusing on jazz, music, race relations, and how that ties into um, faith and proclamation of belief. 
and he he is very very excited about it and he's taught a, a jazz history course for a number of years so um yeah he he's thrilled to be able to do that so a few more months hang on and and in, in the deep darks of february you can listen to some jazz and and learn about that with him yeah and we're going to continue, I can say, as chair of adult ed, we're planning to continue the faith and humanities um, piece, uh, which is uh, each Thursday evening, uh, the third Thursday of every evening, sorry, not every Thursday evening, um, variety of topics. But yeah, as Elise beautifully pointed out, one thing that I noticed is, okay, where's music? Mm -hmm. You know, why, why aren't we doing music? So um, Yes, and I do want to extend to all of you who watch through YouTube, you're watching the recording, you're through live. We love you and appreciate you as well. And we truly hope that you benefit from this too. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you. Do you have, uh, on the spot, do either of you have a musical blessing? You know what? We're going to let you do that, Sarah. You opened us. <laughs> I'll just say then, may the Lord bless and keep all of you, and may we indeed sing songs of life and of praise all of our days. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thanks. Everybody.